Ace Combat 7 is an arcadey dogfighter released in 2019 by the Japanese. You can pretty easily tell the region of origin because in their alternative universe of Strange Real, and no, I'm not making that name up, Japan has evolved into an entire continent, and conveniently the continent where the entire game takes place. The rest of the world looks like a rendition of Earth geography by a middle schooler with a really big fascination for Greenland, and that might even be a slight against middle schoolers. I've actually physically turned into an r slash Halo user working on this video for two weeks, so please press the engagement button so that my life can have meaning. Now, if you're capable of basic pattern recognition, you might realize that Arcady Dogfighter set in an alternative universe sounds a whole lot like the game I just covered in part, Project Wingman. That game has a dev team of three people, one composer, one writer, and one Australian. Said Aussie worked on everything else. He's listed as an artist and developer, but presumably had to do everything on the project designing the whole game from scratch. That's a hell of a lot of work to put on yourself, not only working on accurate plane models, but a flight model too, and all the mechanics to go along with that. All the level, UI, sound design, oh my god, just taking on the development of an entire 8 hour game like that just makes me shudder. Just for some context, the dev team of Ace Combat 7 looks like this. Sped up, 10 times. Look at it go, Jesus, just doesn't stop! So AC7 had hundreds of people working on it and came out only a year prior to Wingman. Surely then, it must blow that indie game out of the water, right? Well, you'd sure think so. It's originally a port of a PS4 game and, oh, it shows. Little minor nitpick coming up here. I had to hex edit that EXE to change my FOV. I'm really glad there are no industry standards for this or anything like that. The camera control with the mouse is rather scuffed as well. There isn't any way to exclusively control the camera with your mouse. And I know this sounds like an extremely minor nitpick, but it's the main reason I enjoyed PW as much as I did. Being able to take in your surrounding individually from flying your damn plane is immensely satisfying and fun, and you can't do it here. You can hold the button to look around, and so you'd think, oh, I'll just make a macro, but of course it's sticky and isn't one-to-one -one with mouse movement, because why would it? On top of that, there's no button mapping for controllers, and 4K support is entirely broken. Needless to say, none of these problems exist in Project Wingman. How innovative it is to have FOV sliders and remappable fucking buttons that you can access from mid-mission. Only one programmer, by the way. The plots of both games are remarkably unremarkable. There are incredible character moments in Project Wingman, but neither game really has a super enthralling world, and every character in Ace Combat 7 is dull at best, with the sole exception being Count, because he's the only one that gets any development at all. I was just double checking mission orders, Hushin. Both games have practically identical protagonists, with Trigger in Ace Combat and Monarch in Piggly Wiggly. Both are generally unremarkable mutes who eventually turn into war heroes feared by enemies and cheered on by allies. There's a critical difference between the two, though, and one that has very little to do with the characters themselves, but rather those that they're surrounded with. The supporting cast in Ace Combat, as previously mentioned, is incredibly boring. Your squad is always in flux throughout the campaign, which seems nice from the onset as it adds a rather morbid threat of who will die next, but no one except Count is around long enough for you to form any sort of meaningful attachment to them. Wingman, on the other hand, has a wonderful supporting cache that actually has consistent screen time. Excluding the finale, there are a grand total of three real operations where you have to go a man down, and only one of those three is a solo op. The game doesn't really hit the same without the allies that you actually like, and it's something that, in my opinion, is really missing from Assassin's Creed 7. Just from memory, I can tell you that Diplomat, Comic, Galaxy, Prez, and to a lesser extent Kaiser are almost always with you and feel like good friends by the end but AC7? I beat it the day that I was writing this, and literally could only remember Count and Wiseman from the story. I'm sort of making it sound like AC7 is completely awful to play and generally experience, but it's not. I'm making it sound way worse than it is. It's a quality title in its own right, it's just that Project Wingman does everything better. Compliments coming from people who already speak often and who you've grown a fondness for feel a lot better than the otherwise mute squad mates who you've just met that mission. And then comes the nicknames on display. As the campaigns go on, Monarch and Trigger start to get referred to as the Crown and Three Strikes respectively. Do I even have to argue which one feels better to be called? As 
as long as we're on this point about characters, let's bring up the de facto antagonists. Ace Combat's Mihai is way, way more boring than Crimson 1. Mihai literally shows up three, arguably four times, is unkillable the first two, and barely talks. To talk about him any more means that I have to regrettably bring up the story, and despite the fact that we're having a good time, let's do it anyway. This is Yerusha. King Obama declares war on the entire Yujin continent with his drones and conquers most of it before the mute beats his entire country into submission single-handedly, and somehow makes the map go from this to this. The Erusion drone AI is like neural network trained on Mihai's combat experience, I guess? Despite all but two being dramatically inferior? Anyway, I don't really want to talk about AC7's plot because, to be frank, it's pretty hot garbage. It's like if you took a Call of Duty plot and then applied it to planes. All the cutscenes are practically entirely unrelated to anything that happens in the gameplay narrative, and it's oddly light and fluffy considering the subject matter. Mihai's boss fights are frustrating. The first two because anything you do is pointless, but the last is admittedly significantly more fun, but it's held back by the narrative. You have to listen to all the dialogue to finish before you can actually kill Mihai proper, something that was quite obvious when he died instantaneously the second people finally shut up and went radio silent. He's still flying, but his plane's been damaged. Finish him off, Trigger. Unfortunately though, I don't really think any of his fights compare even slightly to Project Wingman's dogfights with Crimson 1, even if you can kind of kill Mihai with himself via UAVs. The first time Crimson Squad shows up, this giant warning flashes on the screen informing you very politely to get the fuck out of there. You, as is tradition, disregard this order completely and charge head on to Crimson Squad. After you endure enough of Crimson One's radio filter and terrible dogfighting capabilities, he'll start crying and piss off as your team lambasts you with the praise in this dialogue that I genuinely love. He got lucky. Holy hell! You've chased them off! Uh, Monarch! RTB before they get any funny ideas. What the hell, Monarch? Since when do you fight like that? Must have missed that class back in the academy. To talk about his involvement in the story, let's back up a little bit and actually discuss Project Wingman's plot. It's set 400 years after Christ, where Putin trolled the Ukraine so hard that the tectonic plates performed a smidgen of tomfoolery and destroyed most of human civilization. The Federation from FTL are using deposits of cordium, a highly reactive material created from Putin's nuclear hellfire, that are in the northwestern US. But the denizens of California are fed up and don't want their murder rocks to be used for genocide anymore and want out. Unfortunately for those surfers, it's illegal for states to secede from the United States as per a Supreme Court ruling, and so the Federation authorizes the use of nukes- wait, wait, hold on, that's a little bit too far, let's tune it back a second. You play as Monar, a mercenary from the Sicario Mercenary Corps. You get hired on by the California Independence Force to fight off the Federation and secure the freedom of southwestern Canada. You fly with your two wingmen, Diplomat and Comic, who, all together, make up Hitman Squad. will go on to single-handedly win the war for the Cascadian forces. Sorry, I kind of forgot all about AWACS Galaxy. He's your, uh, how do I put this in digestible terms? Uh, like your spotter? Plain spotter. Yeah, that's him. Crimson shows up a handful of times to try to stop you, but is routed most every time. After the Federation launches nukes, they cause calamity too, where all the cordium deposits get so goddamn mad that they perform lightning. After a time skip, you, Hitman Team, all of Sicario, and all of the Cascadian military forces launch an assault on Presidia, the ex-capital of eastern Hawaii. The fight is pretty easy, a bit disappointing for a final mission, honestly. After it's all said and done, a ceasefire is declared and all hostilities stop. Until they don't. That's right, Crimson 1 just nuked an entire capital city. 
killed tens of millions, and probably caused the destruction of the planet. Now fight atop their graves. That's the last mission. AC-7's last mission? Fight in an extremely cramped environment against this robot plane that goes about as fast as a dementia-riddled slug who makes no attempt to try to fight you. Which one do you think is more memorable? The ring around the rosy underground, or fighting a deranged war criminal over... After he just nuked the city and probably killed all of your friends. Just look at the color palette differences too, good lord. There's a lot of idle dialogue in these games. I sorta of already made a video on that, so I just want to focus on one aspect, the radio filter. I ended up cutting this out of the first video, and then almost cutting it out of this video twice, but as it's long enough already, I might as well. The equation is very simple. More radio filter equal more gooder. Ace Combat's radio filter is maybe 10% of Project Wingman's. Let me demonstrate. And so, as you can see, the math definitely checks out. We can objectively conclude that based combat is at most 10% the quality of Project Conquest exists, but talking about it in depth would get in the way of gushing about the final fight with Crimson 1. Difficulty wise, Project Wigman on Mercenary is mmm, magnifique, shifts kiss, mwah. That aforementioned fight with Crimson 1 becomes probably the best final boss fight in any game I've ever played. He starts with a fresh squadron at the beginning of the fight and gets about three times the total health, and you can't see his health in the final phase. This is on top of you only being able to take four missiles before meeting death's door. This shit was so hard, and I loved every second of how dick-breakingly difficult it was. <sighs> you both push your planes to their absolute limits as you struggle against each other in this battle of literally what the fuck is even on my screen right now. Every time the aircraft damage indicator pops on screen, you quickly look over to your health indicator to see just how much your plane was fucked up while you're wrestling with one doing exactly the same thing. Would you hear Crimson One scream? I'm right there with him. That's you, that, that's how you feel. The music is going fucking crazy in the background while Crimson is launching billions of railgun rounds and these bullshit balls everywhere. Don't worry, Crimson. I won't be forgetting you anytime soon. Nor the goddamn missile alert indicator. When I joked about it replacing my tinnitus, that wasn't a joke. I can't hear this game's music without it anymore. Please send help. I'd like to actually thank my patrons vocally this time as it feels like a little bit of a landmark project for me. At time of recording, I think this is probably the best video I've ever made, so it seems like a nice send-off. Subscribe or something? I don't know. Anyway, very sincere thanks to your commanding officer, Emily, Aegis, Clary, and Xerxes. Good name, by the way.